Hi, this is Tarek Sami and Manos Berlakis, and this is case 174 for the Manual of CTO Interventions. This is a case illustrating some of the potential risks of using stiff coronary guide wires. The patient was an elderly gentleman who presented with angina as well as polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. He had previous coronary bypass 28 years prior with bilateral IMA, that unfortunately both uh, of those IMA grafts were occluded. He also had a vein graft to the first diagonal that was also filling the LAD that had undergone PCI two years prior. He also had previous iliac stents, cardiomyopathy, and contrast allergy, and was premedicated for the contrast allergy before diagnostic angiography. This is um, the angiogram from two years prior. The vein graft was supplying the diagonal branch, and then it was supplying also the left anterior descending artery. And there was a significant lesion in the diagonal at the distal anastomosis, proximal to the, to the touchdown, and uh, that was affecting feeling of the LAD. This was successfully stented with a drug eluting stand that was placed from the SVG all the way into the proximal segment of the diagonal branch. This was the angiogram on this presentation that demonstrated a CTO of the LAD. This is a flash occlusion. We do not know for sure where the vessel is coming, although there is some calcification. There is also a CTO of the right coronary artery. The circumflex is patent, supplying collaterals to the right coronary artery. And this was the vein graft to diagonal that unfortunately had a significant instant stenosis of the previously placed stent. So one treatment option here would be to treat that lesion. Another option would be to recanalize the native um, left anterior descending artery chronic total occlusion. These were the patient's hemodynamics at the time of presentation with a right atrial pressure of 16 and a wedge of 30 with a mean PA of 44 millimeters mercury. Therefore, it was decided to stop the procedure. The patient was diuresed and then uh, came uh, a couple days later, with significantly improved hemodynamics, RA pressure was down at 5, wedge pressure decreased from 30 to 24, the PA pressure, the mean, decreased from 44 to 27. The decision was made to proceed with PCI of the LADCTO, and pace, because the patient still had a high wedge pressure, we decided to do hemodynamic support. He did have bilateral iliac stents, and uh, the question was whether we could place an impeller device through those stents. And after discussing with uh, vascular surgery, the final plan was to actually place an impeller through the right common femoral artery. There was some difficulty actually advancing the impeller sheath, but eventually it uh, was advanced inside the previously placed iliac stent. As we can see, there is not really any undergrade flow in the limb after the impeller sheath was placed. However, the consensus was to proceed with the procedure and uh, hopefully at the end the impeller could be removed and uh, that would prevent um, significant ischemia of the right lower extremity. The next step was uh, to proceed with PCI of the native LADCTO. We did have a lot of difficulty engaging the saphenous vein graft. We ended up using a diagnostic after an exchange, but it didn't work. Eventually, we used the hockey stick guide instead of the AL1, which is our go-to guide for left-sided uh, grafts. And that eventually was successful. And this is the dual injection. So we do have a CTO of the LAD with ambiguous proximal cap. The length is about 40 millimeters. And then there's a bifurcation on the distal cap. There is the bypass graft that is supplying the vessel um, distally. How to approach this? We thought that the best way to approach this, given the proximal cap ambiguity and the presence of the SVG, would be to go retrograde through the SVG diagonal, and then as a backup, try to go undergrade with IVUS guided puncture of the proximal cap. We did have some difficulty advancing equipment. This was a Corsair Excess along with a Sion Black guide wire that actually did cross through that tight area of instant stenosis. 
and then we were able to advance it into the LED, advance the Corsair XS, and then inserted a workhorse guide wire into the LED. We also had inserted a workhorse guide wire into the diagonal branch. This way we had um, wire access in both the LED as well as the diagonal, which became very important as we will see soon. We performed balloon angioplasty of the tight lesion to minimize ischemia in the LAD during our CTO crossing attempts. And then advanced uh, the Corsair XS and did multiple attempts to cross retrograde. We used the Gladius Mongo that did not advance. We also used a Gaia Second that did not advance. There was significant calcification at the distal cap. Eventually, we used a Horner 14 guide wire that actually did seem to advance after some manipulation. The wire did seem to advance along the anticipated uh, course of the LAD. We did not want to advance it for a long segment, so we took it out and then switched it for a Gaia third guide wire. And uh, that wire also advanced uh, and um, was looped distally, so it seems to be in the proximal LED. However, nothing would go. We could not advance a microcatheter or a sapphire balloon retrograde into the LED. However, we thought that since we had wire into the proximal LED, that we can use the retrograde guide wire as a marker to perform undergrade puncture. So we tried with a Gaia second and also a Hornet 14. But what happened was not what we had expected. We do have a significant large vessel perforation where we're, going, where we're trying to advance our guide wire. What do we do for the perforation? The first step is always to inflate a balloon to occlude the vessel. And then for a large vessel perforation like this one, use a cover stand. So we did use a balloon that sealed the perforation. And then um, we delivered a 3.5 by 15 millimeter papyrus stand that uh, actually delivered fairly easily and that uh, stabilized the patient. There was actually a transient loss of pulsatility during um, this period of time, but um, the mean pressure did not significantly decrease. We then um, um, ballooned again the proximal limb of the South Venus vein graft and took a picture. And uh, to our dismay, it was actually not only a perforation of the proximal cap, but we have a perforation at the distal cap. So this explains actually what happened. We had advanced the retrograde guide wire not into the vessel architecture as we thought, but instead we had perforated. And then uh, the wire we were using as a marker of the lumen actually was outside the coronary artery, and that explains the perforation of the proximal cap. How to seal this perforation? This is a little different because there is a small track going into this area of perforation. So initially, we try to deliver a coil. We deliver the microcatheter all the way into that tract and try to deliver an axiom coil. But actually, the track was very small, and we were unable to deliver the coil. We uh, ballooned and trying to deliver a PK papyrus, another 25 by 15 millimeter cover stand, but it would not go. But uh, fortunately, we were able to advance, to our surprise, a six friends guideliner that went essentially all the way to the area of perforation. And then after doing that, we were able to easily deliver the papyrus stand that was um, deployed and uh, overlapped more distantly with. Uh, um, another Zion stand, and this provided a nice result, sealing of the perforation, but there is um, some pinching of the origin of the diagonal branch. This was addressed by using a Sasuki dual lumen microcatheter for rewiring into the diagonal branch, and then we removed the jailed guide wire from the diagonal and did kissing balloon inflation and along both limbs of the distal anastomosis of the vein graft. And then proximal optimization with a 3.0 by 8 millimeter NC balloon. We tried to deliver another stand a little further down into the LAD, but we had difficulty delivering. And actually, the stand came out of the balloon shaft, but fortunately, it was able to be removed from the guide. 
So that was the final result. We decided to not attempt further to do more percutaneous coronary intervention. We have sealed both uh, the perforation into the left main and the perforation from the retrograde limb. And the patient actually did have an uneventful recovery. There are many lessons from this case. The first one are the potential risks of perforation with stiff guide wires. Wires like the Confianza Pro 12, the Hornet 14, the Astato 20, those very stiff guide wires have high penetrating power, which is great when we're dealing with balloon or wire impenetrable caps, both undergrade and retrograde, but at the same time, they do carry a significant risk of perforation as it happened in our case. The best way to use them is to just puncture the cap for a few millimeters and then change them for a less aggressive guide wire. But nevertheless, uh, as was happened in this case, the risk remains for causing a perforation. The second lesson is when you have a large perforation here. We had a perforation from the left main when we're trying to wire into the LAD. There was a transient loss of pulsatility, but we inflated the balloon quickly, then delivered the covered stand quickly, and that sealed the perforation. Here, we actually had perforation in two areas. We had the retrograde perforation and an undergrade perforation. So that is why when performing the retrograde approach, it is important to confirm that if a perforation happens, there is no bleeding into that area of perforation from the retrograde pathway, as was the case here. This perforation could not be sealed with a coil, although it was in a small track. Instead, we used another cover stand to cover the origin of the perforated vessel, which was the proximal LAD in this case. So in summary, use stiff guide wires with great caution, because although they are very powerful and have great penetrating power, at the same time, they can cause significant complications, as in this case. Thank you very much.